the day that you have made, and we will rejoice. We will be glad. We will praise your name. We will give you glory. We will give you honor, Lord God, for who you are, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We welcome you in this place, Lord God. God, we pray, God, that you would forgive us for sins of omission and sins of commission because, God, what we understand and know is that there is no lack in you. We know that your power is still available and potent as ever. We know that sometimes our sins separate us from you. And so, God, we want to get it straight, Lord God. We want to be in fellowship, right fellowship with you because we don't want anything to hinder this walk with you, our prayer with you this morning. And so, Daddy, we invite you in, Daddy. Daddy, there are so many in need of you this morning, God. So many hurting, Lord God. God, we pray, God, that your spirit would be present in this place. Your spirit would bring forth healing and deliverance. Your healing power, your peace, God, that surpasses all understanding. We invite you in, Daddy, to, to um, mend the brokenhearted. We invite you in, Daddy, to, to be with those, God, who are dealing with very serious medical challenges challenges. We invite you in, Daddy, to deal with those, God, who have lost loved ones several over the last couple of weeks. We invite you in and ask that you would comfort only as you know how. Daddy, we invite you in to have your way in this place. God, we pray, God, that you would do what you want to do with this service, Lord God. We pray, God, that you would blow the blinders off, Lord God, of um, anything that we've put in place, God, that is not of you, not like you, Lord God, we pray that your spirit would be at work, Lord God, to do what only you can do, Lord God. We don't put you in a box and we don't put you in a bubble, but God, we invite you in to do whatever you want to do this day, Lord God, that your power would be, would be present. So God, do what you do today, Lord God. We pray, God, for the word that's going to come forth, Lord God. We already know your word has power. You are your word, God. Your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. That's your word. That's what you said, and you don't lie, and you don't make any mistakes. So, God, we pray, God, that we would have ears to hear and apply your word this day. So, God, prepare us. Prepare us for your word this day. So, God, be glorified today in every aspect of the service. Be glorified, Daddy. In Jesus' name, amen. as we sing praise and worship unto our God. Just how incredible 
God, my Savior. If you know it, sing with us. God, my God, my deliverer. God, my deliverer. Yes, he is. 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 Say, God. Praise the Lord, Junior, and good morning. Every praise is to our God, amen? He's our Savior, he's our Deliverer, and he's our Healer. And each and every, those, each and every one of those areas, God has delivered me and saved me and he's healed me. And I give him praise, honor, and glory for it this day. And right now, uh... It's time for our tithes and offerings. As God has blessed you, give back to God. And don't forget about our uh, corporate campaign. You, it's still going on and you can continue to give as you, as you can. Now you're in the hands of the ushers. Oh, what? 
could see. I got the victory for he is my king. He's the reason that I see. No matter what the problem may be, I'm gonna let him for the whole world to see. I got the victory for he is my king. He's the reason that I see. He said if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. I know that I'm gonna lift him up till he speaks from eternity. He said if I be lifted up, I'll draw. Victory for he is my king. He's the reason that I see. He said if I be lifted up, I'll draw. Thank you and bless you, God, for these offerings, God. God, we pray, God, that you would magnify him, God, um, for the uplifting of your kingdom, God. God, we pray, God, that um, the funds needed, God, to do your kingdom business would be uh, magnified, God, to its greatest extent. God, we pray your blessings over those that gave and those that had not to give. God, we pray your blessings over them in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> amen. I'd like to introduce um, our speaker, introduce and present um, to some. Um, our speaker for today will be, um, our minister of the word today will be uh, Minister Oki Mallory. Amen, amen. 
you know, I know he's our friend and our brother, and, and he really doesn't need any introduction, but I, I just got to just say a little bit. Um, I know he, you know, such a humble man, wouldn't want anybody to, um, you know, he just said, just tell him Oki's coming. I, I, know that, I know that's what he would say. I'm just Oki and I'm coming. But he is truly, truly, truly a man of God um, after God's own heart. Um, when we had two services, he would be here every service, playing every service, just dedicated um, to the work of the ministry. And if any of you have talked to him for a while, he would be after, he'll be after church talking to you. He'll be after church praying for you. Or he'll just stop in his truck one day on the way somewhere and stop and encourage your heart. That's the kind of man that he is. Um, you know, your furnace is messed up. He'll come over and fix it. I've seen him under the hood of cars. I've seen him um, uh, packing up people. Somebody else just hollered out something else. Packing up people, moving people. Last week he was in there flying around cooking that wonderful breakfast. Did anybody get that wonderful breakfast last week? He was one of the ones doing that. But that's just the kind of man that he is. He, had a, he has a servant's heart. Along with being an awesome, I think Carla would say a wonderful husband. Wonderful husband, wonderful father, and um, I'm proud to call him my friend. So um, he's going to come to you. I, you're, you're in for a treat. You already know that. Um, I know that he spent time this week um, from God hearing what it is that God would have to say to us and to him. So just keep him lifted up. Keep him lifted up. Um, even today he's doing double duty. So keep him lifted up because we don't want any hindrances um, uh, as far as what God wants to say to us today. So after this last selection, the next voice you will hear will be that of Minister Oki Mallory. Amen. Oh! 
Come on, let's do what the song said. Take a moment, reflect, and think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me. My soul will cry out, hallelujah. Come on, let's bless God. Thank you for saving me, a wretch like me. Hallelujah. Ain't nobody ever been bad in here but me, I guess. But my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. God is an awesome God. Can I get a witness? God is an awesome God. We give God all our praise, all the honor, all the glory, because truly, truly it all belongs to him. Anybody know it all belongs to you? Song says, my hallelujah, it all belongs to Hallelujah, hallelujah. And if the old saints was here saying, my thank you, Jesus, it all belongs to. <laughs> yes, uh, he's so worthy of our praise. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, our God is worthy. Our God, he's just worthy. He's just worthy. And all I have to do is just think about. There's power in just thinking. When I think about the goodness of Jesus. Come on, come on. Would you, can, we, can we just take a moment and do some thinking? When I was in the club and had no business being there. When I was laid up somewhere, I had no business being laid up. When I was in the car and it flipped over, all I got to do is just think of the goodness. <laughs> had more bills than I had money. When I think, that's all you got to do is start thinking about it. You remember when you only had one dress in your closet? Now all you got to do is open your closet and begin to think. Thank you, Lord. We got shoes to match every outfit. We got ties to go with every suit. All I'm trying to do is get you to think. God has brought us a mighty, mighty long, I wish I had a witness in here. God has brought us. And here's what I like about God. In spite of you, in spite of all that you've done, God has brought us. <laughs> I give him praise. I give him honor. I give him glory. Because truly, God is worthy. God is worthy. Let me settle our hearts and our spirits. There is a word from the Lord. Uh, but as usual, I like to get preliminaries out of the way. Uh, and what I mean by preliminaries, what I mean by that is, I always want to give honor uh, and thank God for my children. Uh, I think Caleb's over here, Kobe's here. Where, hey, where's Keona at? Oh, she, oh, there she is. There, that's right, that's right. My baby's here, that's right, that's right. Hey, they never should have gave me texting. Because, <laughs> you know, uh -huh, y'all wanted me to have it, didn't you? So now I'm texting, where you at? <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> you know, first day, you know, they, Daddy, you need to get texting. That's all we do. We send text. You know, I used to have a track phone for years. I'm, hey, I'm just being honest. Hey, y'all the ones spending $300 on a phone bill. I'm laughing at this. I'm mad at the $20 I'm spending on my track phone. But they wanted me to get a, a, a regular phone, get on a plan, and then they wanted me to get texting. So I said, Lord, thank you for texting. And y'all, I'm learning how to use these emojis. Is that what it is? Uh, now I'm sending out all these sad faces. <laughs> I know that's right. Where you at, sad face? <laughs> what you doing, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if we can't enjoy the word, we're in trouble. Uh, the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And anybody that's tried it, 
we ought to be laughing. Out, hey, we ought to be just celebrating and have a good time. It's a few things I tasted I didn't like. And I ain't lost my taste for wine and beer either, y'all. But God has given me a new taste bud. I know you holy. I know he talking about wine and beer. Hey, I done saw some of y'all at the liquor store. Y'all ain't lost y'all taste either. <laughs> I seen you. <laughs> Have a little fun. It's just a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, to loosen up a little bit. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. Now, I don't, it don't mean I, I don't have some problems. It doesn't mean I don't have a few situations going on uh, in my life. But I've made up in my mind that regardless of my circumstance, re regardless of my situation, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let me tell you why I rejoice. It, it is because of the Lord's mercy. I wish I had a witness. Uh, that I'm not been consumed. For they are new. Woo. Not every other morning because I'd, I'd have got killed the other morning. But every single morning, God showers his mercy, his grace in our lives. Undeserving, because y'all know we don't deserve it. It's good to see my friend, uh, Brother Rick, in the loss of your family. Just know that we, you are in our prayers, uh, Brother Kyle, uh, in the loss of your family. Just know you're in our prayers and thoughts. And, and just know God is able. God is able to carry us through. And a few others here are fresh from the hands uh, of bereavement. It's tough, you all. It's tough. You know, it, it's not easy. And so we need to care for each other. We, we ought to stop saying they ought to just get over it. You know, dang, dang, they've been gone three weeks. They, dang, how long they going to mourn? Now, you wait till you lose somebody. You be the main one all in the cast. Ah, don't go. Y'all ever saw that at the funeral? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Uh, but finally, I said my three kids, but you all, I got the best wife in the world. Come on, Carla Jean. Woo-hoo. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, what's they say? She all right. Hey. Hey, beauty is in the eye. Now watch out now. I don't care what you think. <laughs> Amen, amen. That's my baby there. I love her to death. And then I like to honor my mother and my father. Thank God for dad and mom coming down. The Bible says to all the children, honor your mother and, and your father. Listen, that your days may be lengthened and long. And, and some translations say that it may go well with you. And so I'm trying to honor y'all because I want it to go well. Actually, I got a selfish motive at heart, me. <laughs> I got a selfish agenda here. Uh, there is a word. Uh, if you don't mind turning in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, I tossed and turned uh, uh, a while with this word uh, because this word is what I call a transition word. It's a word that if you grasp the concept, if you grasp uh, what it is uh, the word is really teaching, uh, it can transform your life. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the word is sharp. It's quick, it, uh, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to cut asunder uh, the marrow. From, listen, it can get way down in those places uh, in order to do some separating. So this word, uh, I've shared it with my dad and and anybody else that will listen to me preach, I all, I'm always preaching. And so I shared with him a couple of times. And, and God just wrestled me, wrestled me, wrestled me, wrestled me. and said, oh, uh, they got to get this. Because if the people of God get this, the church can be transformed and changed forever. If, if we as the people of God, listen, the church is not this building, you all. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. This is a place that has been sanctified, set apart for the use of the things of God. Y'all, you know, we can meet outside and still have church. Am I right? We can meet at the YMCA and still have church. So church is not a building. That's the, the place that we meet. We gather. And I got some, I got some bad news with some of y'all. When the Lord come back, he ain't coming back after no building. He's coming back after people. 
which is us. We make up the church. Let me read a little bit of this, 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, let me read here. Starting at verse 6. <clears throat> I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to stop. I'm not going to read it all as 6 through 15, but let me read a little bit to give you a gist, the gist of this. He says it like this, but this I say, this is Paul talking, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also, how? Bountifully. It says it like this, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity or compulsion, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And I'm going to throw verse 8 in just to, he says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Amen? Amen. Thank you for hearing the, the passage. Uh, for a subject, we're going to use principles, principles to give by. Principles, principles to give by. Just for a thought so that you can kind of begin to wrap your mind. This is a very, very, very transitional word. And I said that earlier because if you grasp what Paul is teaching under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in this text. Your life can and will be changed literally forever. Literally forever. You all know God is still a miracle worker. And we say it in the song, what he done for others. He will do the same thing for you. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. Let me give you this introduction. Paul is the writer of this particular letter. This is very important. To the church at Corinth, noting that uh, it was written some 27 years after the inception of the church. This letter was penned some 27 years. And we're talking about the church in terms of Acts. Uh, Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. When, when they prayed, the Holy Spirit came on them. Uh, uh, some theologians believe that was actually the the conception or the birth of the church, uh, which is in Acts. Uh, it says, he is encourage, encouraging uh, them along with others to continue sharing and giving to the poor Christians. Uh, in Acts 4 and 4, it says, the church had experienced accelerated growth, stating at one point that even 4,000 had come at one time. So the church is booming, y'all. It's growing. I mean, it's, it's a church without walls, literally. It says, mean, many being filled with joy and of one heart, according to Acts 4, 32 through 37, here's what they did. They sold land and they placed it at the apostles' feet uh, uh, to support the growing needs of the church. So get what's going on. The, uh, the church is booming. Uh, the church is growing. And, and certainly when you begin to build, to grow, uh, you need some finances because people are coming in, all manner of people. Uh, it says, as a result of this disbursement, there was no lack uh, within the body of Christ. In other words, when, when people begin to, uh, to give uh, in terms of supporting of the ministry, nobody in the body went without. So if somebody needed a pair of shoes, guess what they got? A pair of shoes. If somebody needed a light bill paid, guess what they got? They got their light bill paid. So in, in the body of Christ, when the church began to boom, the needs began to get met because people that had surplus, they would bring their gifts, lay it at the apostles' feet. And so as a result, all the needs were met in the body. It says, uh, those who had been persecuted for the sake of the gospel and the marginalized due to their place in society like the sick, the orphan, the widows, and the handicapped, they all needed support. So now get this. You know, God has a tender heart uh, for orphans. It's not their fault. Uh, God has a, has a tender heart for widows, people who had lived in such a way and, and lost their, their, their livelihood. Now, you know, in that day, uh, when you lose your man or your child, you lose your source of income. 
That's what Ruth, part of the story of Ruth and Boaz was about. You, you know, you lose your source of income because uh, the tendency in those days were that uh, women were, were, were generally, uh, they kept the home, they kept the family together. And I applaud and thank God for a woman uh, who keeps the home and the family together. In 2 Corinthians 8, uh, Paul bragged on the liberal gift of the Macedonians. We're in chapter 9, but in chapter 8, Paul actually was bragging uh, on the gift of the, of the Macedonians and how they gave to meet the needs of the poor saints at Jerusalem, encouraging the talented and gifted church at Corinth not only to excel uh, in faith and utterance and in knowledge, but to abound and excel in this grace of giving. So Paul told him, he's writing this letter, he said, now, now you all, the church at Macedonia, uh, uh, the churches at Macedonia, they gave and to the point where they fulfilled every need. And, and so he's writing this letter and he says, he said that now, I, you know, anybody uh, that was a Bible scholar, you, you would understand that the Bible says the church at Corinth, they lack no gift. The, the church at Corinth was very talented, very gifted. But the problem with the church at Corinth is they were immature. <laughs> They were immature. The church at Corinth, they were doing everything under the sun. <laughs> but, but let me just drop this on you. Sometimes it, you know, people are very gifted, but being gifted and mature is two different things. There are some places that your gift will take you that your, mature, your maturity can't sustain you in. Y'all missed that, didn't you? There, there are some places that your gift will take you, but your maturity immaturity will drag you down and so it's important that's why the Bible says to grow in what? Grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is in your best interest to begin to get mature because you'll mess around and you'll be gifted. Somebody will spot your gift and you'll get elevated to a certain place but how many of you know the Bible says pride coming before what? Y'all better listen to what the scripture is saying he told him to excel also in this grace of giving. Paul noted that Titus and a delegation of trusted, trusted brothers were on their way to pick up the gift. End of chapter 9, he said, now, now, now to this church at Corinth, he said, I'm going to send a delegation uh, of trusted brothers. Titus is going to be with them. You all read that when you get a moment. He said, I'm going to send them now. Uh, and they're on their way to pick up this gift because I want you guys to begin to excel in everything. Listen. Round yourself as a Christian. Round yourself as a Christian. Let me tell you what I mean by this. Don't just be all good at this and then horrible at this over here. Does, does that make sense? Round yourself as a Christian. Mature and uh, try to mature yourself in all areas. Don't just be satisfied that, oh, I'm the, I'm the best singer in the house. Oh, I can sing, but you're a horrible wife. Round yourself as a Christian. So Paul challenges this church. He said, I know you, you are excelling in faith and all of these other things, but also I want you to excel in this gift of giving. Just making sure you understand and have this introduction. So in chapter 9, Paul reminds the church of the delegation that's on their way. And he wanted them to have the, the gift ready when the delegation comes, lest he be embarrassed. Because, you know, Paul was boasting on the church at Corinth. And he said, now, don't, don't have me, you know, don't, don't embarrass me, y'all. Anybody ever had a kid getting in public and embarrassing them? And we used to say stuff like this, act like you got some home training. <laughs> so Paul said it to this church. He said, now, I'm sending these men up here to get this money or this delegation of men to pick up some money. Y'all don't embarrass me. Now, I've been bragging on y'all how, how loving y'all are and how giving y'all are. Now, you know, ain't nothing worse than somebody get there and the church ain't, ain't took the offering up. So let's keep both. So he boasted on their behalf. Uh, it is amid this climate that this letter is written. I did that so that you can en encompass the background of this message. It's amid this climate that this letter is written. Ultimately, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be spread and lived out in accordance with God's word. It's with great conviction, you all, great conviction uh, and concern that I share the content of Paul's letter to inform, 
to inspire and to encourage all of us to become better givers. The, the, the content and the context of this letter, Paul shared, and as well with me. Uh, I, I've been kind of seized by God to share this word. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful word because most of you have notes uh, and, and it talks about Paul actually encouraging folks to give. God wants all of us, all of his children to grow in our understanding of giving for the benefit of the gospel. Grow in our understanding. In other words, round yourself. Get, get, it says in all of your getting, get a good understanding. And so that's what the challenge of this message is. As we look at this letter to the church at Corinth, Paul shares three things to remember as they prepare to give. So now get where I'm going with this and then we'll launch into this message. Paul shares these things and, and basically what he's doing, he sent them the, the letter early and, he, and, and get this, he has a delegation of people coming to get the money. But what Paul does is he, he, he shares this letter to encourage and to inspire them to get things together. So with that in mind, this is what he says. Uh, he says in verse 6, But I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. But he who soweth bountifully shall reap also, what? Bountifully. Here's the first thing Paul does. Remember, y'all keep this in mind. He sent this letter ahead to prepare them for giving. He says, now, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. The first thing Paul explains to them is the natural law of sowing. The natural law of sowing. The natural law of sowing. It's important you understand something about, about sowing so that when you have the opportunity, you won't be ignorant. He starts out with, if you sow now sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Actually, the, the, the law of sowing is actually found in Genesis 1.11. Let me, let me read this to you. Now, this is when God was creating things and, 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 and getting everything in order. It's in Genesis 11. He said this. He said, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Verse 12 says this. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit uh, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now in Genesis chapter 8, now that's when God created the earth. Now listen to what he did. God put in motion a, something that is a reality to this day. He said every seed has in itself potential. All right? All right. Now, verse 8, y'all know the earth had gotten bad. Now, by chapter 8, God is like, I'm fed up with y'all. And, and actually, God destroyed the earth. Uh, he destroyed the earth with a flood. But I, I need you to see what happened uh, with this whole idea of um, natural law of sowing. It's, it's found in verses 8, 22. He said this, now, after the flood, Noah gets off the boat. God said this. He says, while the earth remaineth, Let's just look, look at what's going to happen. While the earth is here, there's going to be seed time and harvest. Uh, he said it's going to be cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Now, has that stopped yet? So, so God said something way back in Genesis. You all get this. This, this is going to change your whole life. He said now, as long as the earth remains, it's going to be seed time it's going to be harvest time. And not, not only that, he said every seed in itself bears something. And, and so what Paul was teaching, because they were on their way to collect this gift, he was trying to help them to understand the natural law of sowing. First of all, every seed bears in it potential. Get what, what, what Paul is saying. Every seed bears in it 
potential. Every seed bears in it potential. If you get a seed from the hardware store or Walmart, you get a pack of seeds, all of those seeds bear in them potential. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not all seeds bear the same reproductive potential. Some seeds are one to one. If you put one seed in the ground, you're going to get one plant. You understand what I'm saying? But there's some seeds that bear with them multiple potential. You put one apple seed in the ground, you get a whole tree. So the potential out of one seed, you, you all, if you guys get this, it's going to change your whole life. He said, now, now get this. So there's various seeds. Some have different potential. Now, in order uh, for the seed to bring its potential, it says the seed must be sown. You can't hold a seed in your hand and expect for that seed to bear. You all, I'm trying to preach a little bit. <laughs> now, if you, if you hold that seed in your hand, next week that seed's still going to be. If you hold that seed for a week or a year, that seed's still going to be. I'm trying to help somebody. If y'all get this, you're going to say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so seeds must be sown in order for its potential to be recognized or experienced. They have to be sown. Every potential harvest is based on the number of seeds planted. Every potential harvest is based on the number of seeds planted. Now, here's the thing. If you get 10 seeds... And I'm just going to use for a, 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 a quick thought here. Uh, all the youth that I gave some money to, I need you to come up here. Everybody that I gave some money to. Come on now, come on. It ain't, no, I, I didn't give you some money. You get out of here. Every, every youth that I gave some money. Now, come over here on this side. So, so now, now get what? No, you go sit down. I, I took money from you. <laughs> I, yeah, I took money from him to give them money this morning. <laughs> now, now get get what 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 Paul is teaching them. It's a lesson. He said. Uh, now he he he's talking about the law of sowing is what he's trying to show them uh, before the before the delegation gets there. And so um, every seed has potential in it. But now notice some seeds have what? Different potential. So now, let me see here. Who, who did I give a dollar to? I gave everybody a dollar, right? Now let me ask, let me, let me say to you all. Um, can I have my dollar back? <laughs> hey, don't laugh because that's some of y'all. Can I, can I have my dollar back? Now, 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 wait a minute. Now, I'm telling them before I do this, you don't have to give me the money back. You don't have to. That's your choice. Uh-uh, uh-uh, don't coach nobody. Don't try to be slick. So, let me ask you, can I have my dollar back? Yes or no? No. Butter said no. Can I have my dollar back? Yes. Can I have my dollar back? Yes. Can I have my dollar back? No! <laughs> Dang, go on it. <laughs> but now, but now get what I'm doing. I gave all of them some money this morning. I intentionally gave them some money because I wanted to demonstrate something about sowing. Now, I asked for my money back, didn't I? Now, some of them told me what? And then some of them told me, all right. Now, give me my money back. Hey, I just like us at, at, at offering time, we ain't got it together. Come on, some of us writing it out. Just trying to <laughs> JC gave me my dollar back. And Leah gave me my dollar back. But now look what I give back to them. I gave JC $10 back. And I gave Leah $10 back. Because their dollar 
had potential in it. The, no, don't go get no more now. What? Now she's trying to give me $10. Oh, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> but now get what I just did. I gave them something. I didn't tell them why. They didn't deserve it. They didn't ask me. I just gave it to them. And so, but what they didn't know, I knew the potential of what was in there, the money that I gave them. And so at some point in time, all I simply said, can I have my dollar back? Now, what they said was, two said no, and the other two said yes. So when they gave me their money back, their seed back, I gave them the potential that was in their seed. And because I'm a good guy. Now, give me your dollar. Where your dollar at? Let me have your dollar. Where your dollar at? Now, see how easy he's giving his dollar up now? All right, let's give them a hand. But now, look at what I did. I, go ahead, go ahead. I gave them money. I gave them some money even though they didn't give me the money back that I asked them. So I still blessed them. But, but notice this. They got blessed with more because I knew the potential of what I was going to give them. It was one to ten. But they didn't know it. And so when I asked them to give it back to me, when they willfully gave it to me, I blessed them with the potential. Right. So the first thing Paul does, I'm just trying to explain something. You guys, it's going to free your heart. He says, now you guys need to know the law. Now the law of sowing, God does not change. He said, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and there's going to be harvest time. Now, here's what you need to know. Anybody that's a farmer, Deacon Johnson, I think, is a farmer. Don't you farm a little bit? Yeah, he farms a little bit. There's very circumstances that can affect your yield. Listen to what I'm saying. There's, there's some things that can come along and happen. Even though your yield, you have a potential to yield 10, sometimes you only yield 5. Now, I thought about it just in layman's term to get us through this word. Um, the soil that you plant your seed in, that has a lot to do with the yield. I know you, now nobody care what I put my, so, my seed in. You better watch what you're planting in. Because if I throw my seed on the ground, listen, it may spring up. But because the roots can't go down and, into the earth and, and, and get the nutrition that it needs, inevitably the the, 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 the the seed dies. So even though the seed had potential, but I chose to throw my, my seed on the ground, I didn't yield what it was, what the potential of. Let me tell you something else that can affect the yield. Bugs. You mess around there pestling. You mess around there and get a, have a good crop. Y'all know the bugs are waiting to devour your potential. I'm just trying to help you see something. The bugs are waiting to, now listen, you went through all that work and you planted your, your crop, but just like you planted your crop and your crop came up, the bugs were waiting on the crop's potential as well. And in Whiteley, we got some rabbits. I tell you, they'll eat anything. Rabbits are everywhere. And you, if you don't finish your stuff off, ain't that right, Brother Goodvine? What's the groundhogs? We got them bad out here. They'll eat everything. They'll tear your garden up if you ain't careful. I saw a groundhog so big the other day, I said, man, who he staying with? I said, I said somebody feeding him table food because that, that rascal was fat. <laughs> Let me tell you what else. The lack of water. The lack of water can affect your potential. And weeds, you know what weeds do. Weeds actually just, just wrap themselves around and, and they choke out or, or they, they steal uh, from the potential, they, they steal the nutrition. So what happens with a weed is, is, is when you need, uh, uh, say you need a lot of uh, nutrition, what you get from the ground, the weed actually attaches itself 
the Lord just told me to say this. Uh, some of us, uh, uh, we have people in our lives like that. They, they ain't number weeds. And so what they're doing is they're, they're sapping your potential. All right, let's move on, y'all. I'm, I'm about done, Lord, help me. Secondly, secondly, first of all, he, he just wanted to tell, you guys need to understand the law of sowing. But secondly, Paul wanted them to remember the effect that giving has on God. Paul, Paul wanted them to remember the effect that giving has on God. You all ain't, are still in the text, aren't you? I said, y'all, I, I need to get there. Hold on just a second. Look, look at what he says. Um, I think that's in verse 7. Oh, I'm in 1 Corinthians. I should be in 2 Corinthians. Y'all just hold your horses here. Let's listen to what he says. He said in verse 7, Every man, according as he what? Purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a what? Cheerful giver. Listen to what Paul wanted them to understand. He wanted them to understand how your giving affects God. He, he said, now, now, God actually loves a cheerful giver. So now, how does that make you feel when somebody does something that you love. I mean, think about that. He, he said God loves a cheerful giver. So, so, so what Paul was trying to help them to understand, your gift actually has an effect on God. We, we've disconnected this. I, I was blessed to be over at uh, uh, Deacon Goler's house uh, doing a little work around there. And, and let me tell y'all something. Mom be laying it out. Whoo! I told one of the guys, I said, I said, it's so funny. Deke be sitting at the table like, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> let, let me tell you why. Because Deke loves to eat. And it, amen. And it makes Deke so happy when Miss Goler does what he loves. Oh, now Deke can get up. I've been over early in the morning before Deke get up. He may be a little slow, a little grouchy. But boy, when that bacon start cooking, <laughs> Deke start moaning and humming. I said, what? what? I, said, I didn't even know Deke could sing like this. <laughs> but, but listen, listen. Here's what Paul said. I want you guys to understand and know this that your gift actually affects God. It, it has an effect on God. It has an effect on God's mood. <laughs> I know you're like, wait a minute, God, God, God don't have a mood. Yeah, God has a mood. Uh, over in Genesis uh, 6 uh, and 5, listen, the Bible says that the wickedness of man had grown so bad every imagination, everything they could think of, that's what they were doing. That's right before the flood. Listen, the Bible says that it grieved God that he had, that he had even made man. So, so in other words, their actions really brought God sorrow. It, it brought him agony. Their, their actions, because he had made man in his likeness and his image, as time went on, sin had, had uh, developed and got to a place where it was out of control. The Bible says that it had grieved God. But listen, because of somebody's actions, it grieved God. That he had even made man. The scripture also says in Ephesians 4.30, it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. Listen, now, after we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have the Holy Spirit, which is God, dwelling in us. And so your actions have the ability to affect God. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Paul said, now remember, when you, when you get ready to give, just understand this, that how you give and what you give have an effect on God. Because here's what we do. We'll disconnect. Listen to what he says. 
How does your gift affect God? There's, there's, there's three or four givers in here. The first one is a purpose giver. Y'all, I'm still in the text. It says, every man according as he purposeth, where? In his heart. Now, here's what the purpose giver does. The purpose decides is what you, is what you should do. Because remember, they knew that the delegation was coming. So what the purpose giver does is they decide. They said, I know they're coming to get this offering. I am only going to give $50. That's it. That's it. That's the purpose giver. That's good. Because the scripture says, as every man desi uh, decides. So whatever you decide to give, God is actually okay with that. But he wants you to decide. So I want you to give as you purpose it in your heart. So whatever number or figure you come up with that, that you're comfortable with, God said, okay, go ahead and give that. Secondly, there's a grudge giver. Now, a grudge giver displays or, or reflecting reluctance or unwillingness. So in other words, the, the reluctant one is the one that does like this. Oh, they've taken up another offer. Man, they was here last week. And if the Lord will, we're going to be here. <laughs> you ain't going to believe this, but I have the opportunity to look and see how some, some of us act when they say it's time to give. You know, some of us actually get, get discouraged. I've, I've kind of watched some of the countenance uh, on, on our faces and some of us like, and, and, and here's what I've, 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 I've concluded. Some of us have disconnected giving to God. Some of us have disconnected, here I am, the opportunity to give. We've disconnected that. And so when the, when the officers say, hey, it's time for us to, to, to give, we disconnect. And we say things like this, well, I'll be glad when they get over that and we can go back to worship. Did you not know that giving is worship? <laughs> and so when you disconnect that giving is worship, you actually miss an opportunity to worship God through giving. And so when it's time to give, we're like, oh, hey, let's get back to the song. Or let's get back to this. Here's why. Because we think of all of these other components as worship. But actually worship is the whole thing. You know, Pastor Rob is doing a wonderful series on the teaching of the tabernacle. Every, asp uh, every aspect of the tabernacle is worship. From the brazen altar, that's worship. From the labor, that's worship. To the golden incense, that's worship. To the table of showbread, that's worship. It's all worship. And I said, Lord, what is The Lord said, they disconnected. I'm just trying to help you. Think, 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 think. The Lord, said, the Lord said they disconnected. And so when it's time to give, folks shut off. And, 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 and here's what I know. Some of us are embarrassed because we feel as if, well, we don't, I don't have nothing to give. You know, I, I don't have nothing to give. And so I, 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 I'm not going to give my envelope. I don't have an envelope because an envelope in our mind symbolizes the ability to give. And so we shut down mentally. And then, and then we re-engage at some point later. But we forget or, or, or we don't take advantage of the opportunity God is giving us to worship him through giving. So you got the reluctant worship. They give, but they give reluctantly. They give because, you know, I've figured out some people, if you put some people on the spot, they'll do it anyway. If you put them on the spot, and, and, and don't, don't get men on the spot and start stroking our egos. Start calling us stuff like this. Hey, big money. <laughs> oh, look at big money grip here. Hey, when somebody starts calling you big money, they trying to get some money. <laughs> That's a technique I learned a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. That's what I call uh, Carla when I want to get in her purse. Oh, big money Carla. She stopped me right there. Nope, I ain't got no money. I'm like, <laughs> and the other side, she go in my wallet. I don't even know she got my money. <laughs> Secondly, Paul just wanted to encourage them to remember the effects 
that their giving had on them. You got the purpose giver, one who decides, the grudge giver who gives, but they give unwilling. Then you got the necessity giver. Now, the, the, the necessity giver is the one who gives under compulsion. And, 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 and there's nothing worse than remorse after you do something. Y'all ever heard of a word called buyer's remorse? Anybody ever had buyer's remorse? When you was looking at it, oh, I had to have it. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Whoo! This car got these rims on it. Oh, Lord. It's cleaned up, it's shiny, and, 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 and the whole time the dealer telling you, now, you know this is a $40,000 car. Oh, look at here. Now, hey, the, 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 but at the same time, he explained, and look at, look at this. It's got air conditioning. got CD in the back. got control comforts. And then we, we all happy, and we get that car home, and, 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 and we, we're happy for the first month or two that they don't, they don't give us a payment. Listen, because everybody, girl, look at your new car. You looking good. We lean it. We keep it clean. Don't we keep that car clean the first two months? But, Lord, when that payment come in, we get buyer's remorse when the payment come in. And we be like, I ain't need this big old car. I'm guilty. I've done it before. So you ain't, I'm just preaching to the choir. I'm, I bought this car to impress somebody. I've done it. I bought stuff to impress girls, stuff I couldn't afford. I bought shoes and clothes, trying to get a certain look. Some of our credit cards are maxed out, and we got buyer's remorse. Stuff all in our closet, we mad. Dang. A necessity giver. That's the one that gives under compulsion. But the problem with a credit card, a credit card, if you are a compulsive person, you cannot handle a credit card. And so that's what they do. They put all this nice stuff up to get your attention. And, and then they tell you how you look in all this nice stuff. And then you go and buy compulsively all of this nice stuff. Reluctant giver. But really, God only likes one. He likes a cheerful giver. He likes one, he likes a purposeful giver, but he, uh, he, he actually loves. The, the word love in, in the context is agape. It's literally what it is. I looked it up in the, in the uh, Greek. It's agape. God loves a cheerful giver. And here's what he's saying. I love a person who's thoughtful. Don't y'all like people who are thoughtful? Carla likes me when I'm thoughtful. When, when she wants to go on vacation or she wants to do something nice, she actually appreciates when I've been thoughtful. And she say stuff like, uh, like y'all remember Brown? He said, who me? <laughs> That's what Carla do. I said, hey, babe, we going on vacation. What? And, and she already know because she done planned it, but still. <laughs> but the point I'm making is, is your giving has an effect on God. Largely because we, we disconnect giving and the heart of God. You guys, don't forget the purpose of the gift. It was to meet needs for the poor saints. You all, we become a very selfish society, I'm, and I'm included. And, and I, I'm, again, I preach to myself. If it is not about me, myself, my family, or I, it's hard for us to come up off of it. We say stuff like, this, they, hey, they, they messed up their own money. How many times you mess up your money? They need to stop doing this and this. How many times you done done this and that? We're moving on. Finally, and I'm done, you all. Third and finally, Paul wanted the giver to remember who benefits from their giving. Uh, who benefits from the giving? Because... Uh, when you really begin to understand the context of this sermon, God gives you potential. He gives you the ability to choose whether or not you want to plant it or not. He turns around and then he says, I, I really want to see the attitude or the heart of the person. Because that, that, that it almost, it, you know, it, it almost, it borders on unappreciative. 
And you know, as parents and grandparents, one of the things that drive us crazy is when we feel like somebody does not appreciate all that we have done. Now, y'all know that drives, that drives a good parent crazy. And the more you do for a person, um, I think, then daddy used to say this, the more I do, the, the more unappreciative it seems like you get. In other words, it's, it's almost like they're taking you what? For granted. And, and it's almost, it, it almost causes a sick feeling in your stomach because, because when that person comes back around again, they got their hand out again. And, and you, you're kind of thinking to yourself, Man, wait a minute, you ain't thanked me the last 15 times. I paid your rent, you still ain't said thank you. Paid your car note, you still ain't said thank you. I put some groceries in your, th you still ain't said thank you. God is the same way. Your gift, his gift, their gift was going to poor saints. Now listen, these are people who are less fortunate. Y'all didn't forget in the intro, these are people who had been widowed, orphaned, sick. Ain't nobody plan on being sick. But if you keep living long enough, listen, you may be in line for some help. If you just keep on living, I'm learning it now. If you keep living, you, you are, I said old saints say, you liable to be. Because one thing I've learned in life, you don't know what state you're going to find yourself in. Oh, you may be healthy and got, got a good job and plenty of money in the bank today. But you keep on living. Keep on living. Before it's over, you may end up on food stamps. And the same folk you talked about. Because y'all know we talk about folk. Yeah, no, she don't need to be on no darn food stamps. Wait a minute. And you buying half of them. Uh-oh. I, I thought I'd wake somebody up. <laughs> On welfare and all these different programs. Keep living. You don't know. I'm telling you all. You have no clue. Your husband doing good. Hey, you may mess around and be widowed. Hey, I'm telling you all. So, so now the gift was for them. So understand your gift and how it affects God. Last and finally, who benefits from all this? Well, first of all, the Lord told me to tell you, you are the beneficiary of the gift. Now, you say, now, wait a minute. How am I the beneficiary when I give? Look at, look at verse 5 or uh, verse 8. He said it like this. Now, if you give cheerfully, verse 8, it says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward who? Toward you. Now, first thing, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. The people who decide to give, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. When you give, God actually pours grace into your life. Now, if it wasn't for the grace of God, every last one of us would be dead. The Old Testament says it like this. He'll open unto you the windows of heaven and what? Pour you out a blessing that you don't even have room enough to receive it. Who benefits? Who benefits? You benefit. Now, some people say, I'd rather have money than grace. You are jacked up. Because if it wasn't for grace, you wouldn't have no money. <laughs> and if it wasn't for grace, you wouldn't have the capability to even spend the money that you got. Some folk got plenty of money but can't spend it. It's one thing to have steak money but can't taste it. It's one thing to be able to buy a $5,000 bed and can't lay in it. It's one thing to make a million dollars and have no peace. Why do y'all think everybody in Hollywood on dope, strung out, killing themselves? They got all this money. They're missing grace. Who benefits? You benefit. It says not only that, but it says having all sufficiency in all things. You benefit because when you begin to give, what God does is he makes sure he keeps you stocked up. Listen to what God is saying. Now, I'm going to make sure you keep plenty of money because every time I tell you to give my money, I'm going to give you some more of my money. Every time I, teach, I tell you to give some.
some of my money. I'm going to give you some more of my money. Where did I get that from? The Bible says, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He said, the gold is mine. The silver is mine. Everything you have, it all comes from God. Everything you have. I know you think you own something, but I'm going to tell you something. When gold and them wheel you out of here, you ain't taking nothing with them. Job says it like this. Naked came I into the world, and guess how you're going to get out of here? Naked. You didn't come here with nothing. And, and if your family member, I told him, hey, you mess around here and don't got no insurance. I said, I'm going to put you in a pair of tap dancing shoes. You know, because you know, we want everybody to get put away nice. Y'all, y'all, I know y'all. You know, family members argue about that. I want my mama in this, this nice dress. I want my mama buried with all these rent. Y'all know families argue about that. But I done made up in my mind, if you ain't got no nice insurance, you can laugh at me if you want. Hey, you let your tab be on me and see what happens. Now, while you living this nice life, you need to have some nice insurance so that I can put you away just how you want to be put away. Nice. I know I'm preaching. I done been to some of my family. Don't nobody got no insurance. If you want me to put you away nice, you better have some nice insurance. I'm just preaching. Hey, I'm preaching now. I'm telling you, you, you be buried in some tap dancing shoes and a tutu fooling with me. Everybody be mad at the funeral. I don't care what you, care what you mad about. here but who benefits you benefit God says I'm going to make sure all grace abounds towards you you need grace on your job you need grace in your health you need grace in your marriage you need some grace and when you take care of the things that God wants to be taken care of he makes sure that you got some money Listen, I would be a fool not to give a person money that's going to do the right thing with it. If I own it all, oh, I'm going to make sure you stay loaded up. Because you won't have no problem when I massage your heart and say, hey, give that $20 to blah, blah, blah. Matter of fact, I'm working on an offering right now. Y'all missed that. <laughs> hey, get them, Lord. Get them, Lord. Who benefits? You. Because you abound in every good work. The seeds that you sow into the life of people, that's actually the work of God. So that needs are being met. That's the work of God, you all. Feeding people, helping people. The Lord showed me the greatest need for humanity is not a sandwich. It's actually their souls. Your greatest need is soul. It's your soul to be saved. Your second greatest need is discipleship. That's why he gave us the commission. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things and whatsoever I have commanded of you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. Who benefits? You benefit. Grace, abounding in everything. And then I like this. He said, I'll multiply the seed sown. So, so, so when you, when you sow, what God does is he says, I'm going to multiply your stuff. Because here's the thing. You don't know what the potential is of what you got. All God is saying, I need you to sow it. You don't know the potential. The kids did not know that I had them down 10 to 1. And you don't know God got you down 1 to 100. God said, I'm the one who multiplied the seeds around here. 
because I'm the one who gives the seed. He says, who benefits? You benefit because he multiplies the seed sown and then it says he increases the fruit of righteousness. Who benefits? The receiver benefits. They benefit in this way. Their needs get met. Isn't it a blessing to have your needs met? The Bible says it like this, for it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. But has anybody ever really had a need? And how did it make you feel when God massaged somebody's heart? You, I know you was all private and you didn't want nobody to know that you were struggling. But how did you feel when somebody came up to you? I, I always say they gave you that funny handshake. And, and, and you looked in your hand and you said, what, where would this come from? And y'all know we get modest. No, I can't take that. But I, hey, the devil is a lie. Let me tell you what Mama Scaife used to tell me. You ain't going to mess up my blessing. You ain't going to mess up my blessing. Because I figured out that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. See, when you're on the receiving end, you're hurting. When you're on the receiving end, you're down. You're, de you're depressed. You're discouraged. You're frustrated. You're cast out. But boy, when you're on the giving end, God gives you something to give. You ought to be tickled to death. That's why he said, I love an hilarious giver. See, when you really understand that God blesses you, and then he turns around and says, now I need you to go bless somebody else. We ought to be tickling around here. I love it when I see my brother over here during offering time, he starts dancing. We call him Lightfoot. But let me tell you the truth of the matter. He understands. I keep, I'd be like, oh, why come don't nobody laugh at giving time? He said, they don't understand. Yeah. If you got anything to give, you ought to be tickled to death. <laughs> anything. And the problem is, so has anybody ever been broke? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about broke where I can, buy, I can get some money. But I mean broke. Hey, some people can't even borrow money because they didn't have the money to pay back the money that they borrowed. I mean, bro. But now get what God is saying. You mean to tell me you got a little something and you down? You finally come up. You, you finally, instead of paying late fees, now you paying it on time? You ought to be tickled to death. God loves a cheerful <laughs> giver. Who benefits? The receiver benefits because they genuinely experience what it means to be a Christian. Because listen what happened. Those brothers received that offering and then they turned around and gave it to the hurting saints. They benefited because they saw an example of what true Christianity looks like. They benefit because they were modeled to what genuine Christianity looks like. They benefit because it wasn't just lip service. See, it's one thing to say. The, the Bible says it like this. Now, what good is it? You see a brother in need, and you shake his hand and say, go in peace. When God has made sure you had the things that you needed to help that brother. The scripture said that ain't faith. That's not genuine. He said, if you know or see a brother in need, then you need to try to help or respond to that need. That go in peace, that modest go in peace. It's, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. All the folk that just walked on the other side. Who benefits? The receiver benefits because they experience true Christianity. And finally, who benefits? God benefits. Because at the end of the day, that's really who we want to benefit. He benefits, it, it says it like this. It says, being enriched in everything unto all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving. God benefits because folks begin to respond correctly to his blessings. When you get a blessing, you're supposed to bless the blesser. In other words, you should say, thank you. Who benefits? God benefits those who receive the blessing, they begin to say thank you. When they brought that gift in, they were in such disparity. They begin to say praise and thank God that somebody cared about us. We're stuck down here. We're, we're desperate. We, we, we need food. 
we need help. Thank God somebody cared about us. Who benefits? God benefits because he receives the glory. It says it like this in verses 13. It says, while by this experiment of this ministry, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, for your liberal distribution unto them and to all men. It says, and by their prayers for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Who benefits? Verse 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. I'm wrapped up and I'm closed. God actually benefits at the end of the day because when your heart is massaged, you yield, you obey God. Actually, it comes back to him because he gets glory because his intentions in earth are fulfilled. Needs are met. People are encouraged. People are sharing with each other. God begins to get glory. So when somebody is blessed, God says, what do I get? Glory. God is really challenging us to respond because we're in a giving family. Did anybody know that? He's challenging us to respond and become better givers because we came from a giving family. John 3.16 says it like this, For God so loved the world that he gave. All I'm trying to tell you is you come out of a giving family. Not only did, did God give his son, but, but Jesus gave. Jesus gave while he was here on earth. And he walked, listen what he gave. He gave sight to the blind. Y'all ain't gonna believe what he was giving away. He gave healing for the sick. Uh, he gave away hope for the helpless. And he even gave life to the dead. All I'm trying to tell you is we all come from a giving family. And then after he got through giving away all of that, the Bible says that he gave his life. He gave his life for, for a wretch undone like you and me. All I'm trying to tell you is we come from a giving family. God has given us all an opportunity to give. What will be your choice? It's yours. The greatest need is salvation. How God decided that, he gave the gospel to accomplish that need. He said, we're to preach the gospel. We're to go to all areas of the world. To go, y'all, y'all, can you ever heard of somebody getting a free flight to Israel, to Africa, to China? It costs money. Ministry costs money, you all. And if we're going to be effective, pastor says it like this. A ministry that's extensive is what? Expensive. And all God is trying to do is get us to embrace the call he's placed on each and every one of us to give, to be givers. It's an opportunity, you all. Paul wrote to that church at Corinth, tried to inspire and encourage them. Understand what you're doing. I want to challenge everyone in this ministry. If you know God has called you to this ministry, I don't care. Listen, listen. I don't care where you start and how you start. Here's what I want. I want you to give what you have decided in your heart. Paul said it early in Corinthians. He said on the first day of week that everybody lay up as God has in store for him. That they be in their gathering when I come. So decide. Make a purpose. You get paid. Say, hey, Lord, I'm going to give you this. Decide in your heart. And, 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 then, and then when the deacons come and they, they give or extend an opportunity for us to share, get happy. <laughs> Begin to celebrate and thank God for the gift. Because listen, God has given us an opportunity to sow into his ministry. What? This ministry is designed to meet the needs of the community and the world. And we help each other. Y'all know we got a benevolent fund? Some of us have used the benevolent fund. That is a blessing. What if we, you know, there's no benevolent fund without benevolence. So, so don't get cocky to about I don't need it today. Today you don't need it. But Papa Scave said just keep on living. Keep on living. We have a great opportunity you all do to give. I want you to stand to your feet. And if you desire to respond to this message, 
if, if you desire to respond to this message, God gave us something in, in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said it like this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He said, if you, when you hear my voice, he said, harden not your heart. Open the door, let me in. Here's, God gave his son for you to die for the penalty of sin. And here's what you don't have to do now that Jesus died for your penalty. He paid the price for you. 